McConnell family last week. Um, as you know, uh, back in May, something happened that uh, was unusual in terms of my physical situation, and we began to pursue to figure out the cause behind it, and uh, one thing led to another. Uh, so that a week ago this past Wednesday, I was scheduled for a CT scan and an uh, echocardiogram, went in for those. Wednesday morning, the, res the results were not encouraging. Uh, major blockages in, in all three arteries. Uh, they said, pay attention to symptoms, which I got a whole new uh, education on symptoms, uh, on what symptoms are of heart issues. And some of those things manifest themselves Friday morning, a week ago. And so we called the doctor and the nurse said, my advice is, based on the results of your scans, get to the emergency room. So we went. That Friday, they admitted me, uh, began a battery of tests, uh, probing, puncturing. Uh, I told Karen, I said, now I, I, I know a little bit of what it may feel like to be abducted by an alien. It was uh, it's really kind of strange, all the things going on. Uh, and then those results began to come in. Again, not what we had hoped for, but certainly well within God's healing reach. So I want to show you something, all right? I want you to look at something on the screen. This is against counsel. I was counseled not to do this. But I want you to see this. That's, that's a graphic of the three arteries, major arteries in my heart. Your heart looks like that in various stages. On the, uh, the part that's on the left side of the screen, there's a 100% blockage there. The yellow that you see is God's, the, the, the cardiologist called it auto bypass. This is God's bypass surgery on me. Uh, he rerouted, grew an artery that was not there, grew it around the 100% blockage. I've heard of that, that's fascinating to see, but, but the next thing, look at the bottom. There's another yellow line. That is coming from the middle artery, reaching across to that left artery or whatever side it is in my heart, attaching another, growing another artery to give blood flow there. Uh, our God is amazing. Uh, and you've been faithful to pray. This, we don't think this happened last week. This is the doctor's best estimation is this has been going on and God's been favoring me. So many cards, letters, notes, texts, phone calls, visits. Thank you for those. After the heart cath and then the stress test, uh, heart cath Monday, stress test Tuesday, the cardiologist's team decided for the time being they're going to treat me with meds. Uh, that's why the chair is here, by the way. These meds are, 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 I went in the hospital with one, uh, came out, that one was taken away. I've got four new ones uh, that are having some interesting uh, interactions with me. And then for the first time in my life, I'm carrying a vial of nitroglycerin. So if I suddenly blow up, this is why, okay? So thank you. A bunch. I told the doctor when he was releasing us Tuesday, I said, uh, he gave me some restrictions. I said, uh, first of all, you need to know I, I don't intend to rust out, I intend to wear out. And the second thing I said was, if you tell me I can't preach, you might as well go ahead and kill me now. And he backed away. He said, no, no, we, we want you to preach. So uh, here I am. And I thank God for you. You know, it's interesting. Uh, this Wednesday, the 11th, will we'll mark the uh, 14th anniversary of uh, my being here with you. And I thank God uh, that he's let me live to be here with you. And thank you for your prayers. A lot of one another and going. I was on the receiving end of just boatloads of one another. Uh, and, and God bless you for taking that up. The, the memory verse challenge. 
That is, that is, what is that? That is provoking one another to love and good works. So what we're doing is we're laying the foundation for this study on one another. It's a participle, so that it's not an idea, it's an action. Living in, uh, li- living in a gospel community, action. Is we're looking at the verses initially that use the idea of loving one another. I told you there's, there's more than a dozen of these in the New Testament. We're going to look at these because this lays the foundation. Everything that you, that you go forth from, provoking one another, bearing with one another, helping one another, encouraging one another, serving one another, they all flow out of a conscious commitment and recognition that when we are saved by grace, we are saved by one who demonstrated the ultimate manifestation of one anothering and then who said to those who would be on the saving end of his one anothering a new commandment I give you that you love one another as I have loved you so find 1 John 3 verses 11 to 24 in your Bibles this is going to be a two part sermon it became Increasingly obvious the more I read over this and studied this that we'll have to tackle stand with me if you would by the way stand up tackle uh, verses 19 to 24 in a separate installment today God willing we look at verses 11 through 18 loving one another as evidence of faith in Jesus Christ follow along as I read but this is the message that you have heard from the beginning that we should love one another We should not be like Cain, who was of the evil one and murdered his brother. And why did he murder him? Because his own deeds were evil and his brother's righteous. Do not be surprised, brothers, that the world hates you. We know that we have passed out of death into life because we love the brothers. We, whoever does not love, abides in death. Everyone who hates his brother is a murderer. And you know that no murderer has eternal life abiding in him. By this we know love that he laid down his life for us and we ought to lay down our lives for the brothers. But if anyone has the world's goods and sees his brother in need yet closes his heart against him, how does God's love abide in him? Little children, let us not love in word or in talk, but in deed and in truth. By this we shall know that we are of the truth and reassure our heart before him. For whoever, whenever our heart condemns us, God is greater than our heart and he knows everything. Beloved, if our heart does not condemn us, we have confidence before God. And whatever we ask, we receive from him because we keep his commandments and do what pleases him. And this is his commandment, that we believe in the name of his son, Jesus Christ, and love one another just as he has commanded us. Whoever keeps his commandments abides in God and God in him. And by this we know that he abides in us by the Spirit whom he has given us. What have we just read together? The inerrant, infallible, all-sufficient word of God. And my prayer is, as we look through this passage, that some connections will be made, that, that faith in Christ and loving one another flow out of the same saving experience. Obedience to his commandments are evidence of saving faith. And loving one another is at the very top of that list. Thank you. Please be seated. If you're familiar with 1 John, he divides the entire human race into two classes. The children of God and the children of the devil. There's no neutral ground. Anyone who is not uh, intentionally, consciously, conscientiously committed his or her life to Jesus Christ, repenting of sin, trusting in him, You've not become a child of God. You're not a child of God by natural birth. You're a child of the devil. John makes this very clear as he moves through it. There's no intermediate class. For him, there's only, there's only light and darkness. No twilight. He sees only life and death. If you know First John, you know he's very black and white about this. He uses terms like does and loves. These are present tense. They are habitual. In the first part of the letter, he emphasizes righteousness. He shifts, at this point we've found today, uh, to, to love. 
though he uses both terms in our text. Someone has said this. Where one, where righteousness is found, love will also be found. A life of righteousness is a life of love. Indeed, love may be thought of as the highest expression of righteousness. They came to Jesus and said, what's the greatest commandment? Trying to trip him. They hoped he would choose one of the ten. And that they could say, well, so by choosing this one, you've diminished the other nine. He wouldn't fall for their trick. He said, well, the greatest commandment is love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your mind, with all your strength. And the second is like it, love your neighbor as yourself. He, he summarized the Decalogue, the Ten Commandments, the first, first table being love to God, the second table being love to, to one another, fellow man, and said, this is it. Righteousness, which is, which is first of all imputed by the work of Jesus Christ, and we receive it by faith, so we're justified by faith. You're going to be treated to an exposition of that tonight, and I pray that you're going to plug into this. Martin Luther said, we looked at this in 2017 when we looked at the 500th anniversary of the Reformation. Martin Luther said the doctrine of justification is the standing or falling article of the church. The first sermon I ever preached to you was about this doctrine. And to the extent that you understand justification by faith alone and the finished work of Christ alone, the gospel has a really good grip on you and you will be delivered from a lot of error so come to this study tonight uh, and, and take in these these tremendous teachings just let yourself be washed over by this by this wonderful doctrine and so righteousness is first of all imputed by the work of christ then once it's imputed in justification then it begins to be worked out in sanctification righteous living not living in order to be right with God, living righteously because we've been made right with God by the work of Jesus Christ. And so this, this idea the, that a life of righteousness is a life of love. Love is the highest expression of righteousness. And so I want us to see in this passage, begin to see today, there's four headings. We're going to try to look at three today. First is, love for one another is the highest expression of the gospel. Because the gospel is the righteousness of God declared, Paul says that in Romans chapter 1. Second, love for one another is evidence of the new birth. Third, love for one another is supremely demonstrated in the death of Jesus Christ. Fourth, love for one another is evidence of faith in Jesus Christ. So let's, let's try to unpack this. First of all, love for one another is the highest expression of the gospel look at verse 11 and 12 this is the message that you've heard from the beginning that we should love one another we should not be like Cain who was of the evil one and murdered his brother why did he murder him because his own deeds were evil and his brother's righteous this idea of message John uses this term in, in chapter 1 verse 5 this is the message that God is light and in him is no darkness at all and so it's the only two times in the entire New Testament that this term message is used. One, to establish the character of God in the opening verses of the letter. So you might say a, a, a summary of theology. God is light and in him is no darkness at all. And then the second time in this portion of the letter to say that the message is that we should love one another. This is the, if, if, if God is light is the summary of theology Love one another is the summary of Christian ethics. He said, well, let me tell you what's happening. Some uh, in our circles, have, they, they recoil against the idea of, of love because it's, it's been so abused. You know, love today for many people is, is maudlin sentimentality. And that's not what it all, is at all in the scriptures. Not at all. And so we need to come back, recover biblical love and, and put it where the scripture says it belongs. It is the highest expression. This message from the beginning. What is, what's the beginning here? Well, well we don't know if it's, it's from the beginning of time. That's a possibility. But that when God made the first two human beings, our, our first parents, he, he set them in a relationship of love to him and to one another. He came into the garden to fellowship with them. 
And he said, a man shall leave his father and mother, cleave unto his wife, the two shall become one flesh. Leave and cleave, cling to this relationship of love. Sin entered and everything was messed up seriously. But in the beginning, relational love was the demonstration of being a child created in the image of God, loving him and loving one another. It could be that could be from the beginning of Jesus' ministry. Because as I said, they, they tried to trick him, and Jesus demonstrated to the disciples, oh, love the Lord your God with all your being, and love your neighbor as you love yourself. But as we said in John 13, when we looked at this, the first, first time we studied on this, this topic, love one another as I have loved you. So it's an old commandment because it's been around. It's a new commandment because in the hands of Jesus, the lawgiver, it's still on tablets of stone, but now we have the law walking. We see Jesus Christ. We see how he loved others. They comment on him. Behold, how he loved him. So we see it, Jesus, the law walking. And so when John says this in 1 John 2, verses 7, 8, Behold, I'm writing you no new commandment, but an old commandment that you had from the beginning. The old commandment is the word that you have heard. At the same time, it is a new commandment that I'm writing to you, which is true in him and in you. Because the darkness is passing away and the true light is already shining. You see, this passage is going to teach us here that, yes, it's on tablets of stone. Yes, it's summarized, the Ten Commandments. But... It was in Jesus. He's the embodiment of love. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Jesus comes as the ultimate expression of God's love. And then when you're, when you're saved, you're going to see this in the text, then it's, it's, you're made partaker of the divine nature so that love is birthed in you in salvation. Love one another. He contrasts here. It may seem odd to us, but he contrasts the challenge to love with Cain, the first murderer. Because you see, that's what the contrast is. You either love or you hate. You say, preacher, no, that's not right. I, I don't hate people. Well, that's how we feel. It makes us feel good. But the scripture challenges that. You see, the best love you've ever seen from a person who is, is not in love with Jesus Christ is a selfish love. They love because they derive pleasure from it somehow. And so we want to see how we do this. We either love, don't be like Cain. Why did, he, why did he murder? He was evil. He was a child of the devil. The devil comes to steal, kill, and destroy, John 10, 10 says. And you watch people do this to one another. You watch people who are not in Christ destroy one another. I've been doing marriage counseling for almost 50 years now, and... And I can tell you, I've never met the first couple that sat down with me in marital trauma and said, you know, this is kind of where we thought it would go. When I, when I met him, when I met her, I thought, man, I, if I marry this person, I bet you they can recreate to me the closest thing to hell I will ever experience. Nobody comes to it that way. And yet, because love has not been birthed in us, biblical love, agape love, in the new birth, even with that, you know you struggle. Even with that, you know you fight, but at least you fight. Otherwise, a train wreck is on the horizon. Second thing is love for one another is evidence of the new birth. Look at verses 13 to 15. Do not be surprised, brothers, that the world hates you. Why? Because the world does not love. Do you see the absolutes here? 
John does not hold out the possibility that, well, there's just, there's kind of a, a, a nominal affection. No. Do not be surprised that the world hates you. And you know, if the world doesn't show you that it hates you, it's because it's not threatened by you. But you know what's happening, don't you? Don't you see what's happening in the culture now? This culture hates any vestige of God. Drew Brees, New Orleans Saints quarterback, all pro. He'll be in the Hall of Fame. Was participated in a segment for uh, Focus on the Family to promote Bring Your Bible to School Day. Innocuous, right? No. Not to the LGBTQ crowd who assailed him, called him a bigot, insisted that he distance himself from that. Now, Drew Brees is known as a strong Christian man. And he buckled. He apologized, said he didn't know what all this, this connection was. He didn't mean to offend anybody because he just, he believes everybody... Appalling. This is where we live, folks. Do not be surprised when the world hates you. If you stand for Jesus Christ and you say the things the Bible says, you are a bigot. If you believe marriage is for man, one man, one woman, and you happen to sell chicken sandwiches, they are hate sandwiches. They are bigot sandwiches. And people will do whatever they can to shut down places like this. This is the world we live in. So this is not a foreign concept to us. And if you're not experiencing yet, hang on. Hang on, you will. It says, we know that we have passed out of death into life. How do we know that? How do you know you've been born again? And it's not some experience. It's not some fuzzy feeling. It's not even because somebody told you. Because we love the brothers. We love one another. It's family. Karen and I a few weeks ago traveled home to bury my sister. We got to be with family, some we hadn't been with in decades. It's just the connection there, the family. It's in the DNA. Well, there's a spiritual DNA. When you're saved, you're given new life and you like to be around and with others who have that new life we know we pass from death out of death into life because we love the brothers whoever does not love is the force of the verb here is abiding in death now everyone who is hating his brother reference back to Cain is a murderer and you know that no murderer has eternal life abiding in him. So John's, John's dark contrast, black and white, no middle ground language comes out. Jesus said it this way in the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 5, 21 to 22. You've heard that it was said to those of old, you shall not murder. In the Sermon on the Mount, here he is internalizing the law. Do not murder. Six commandments. You've heard the sixth commandment. And whoever murders will be liable to judgment. But I say to you that everyone who is angry with his brother will be liable to judgment. Whoever insults his brother will be liable to the council. And whoever says you fool will be liable to the hell of fire. He internalizes it. You've heard it said, but I say to you, he is the giver of the law. He hasn't changed the law. He has simply exposed the, the intention of the law to bury itself into your heart and my heart so that when we're unconverted, we will find ourselves crying out, Dear God, what must I do to be saved? The, the publican comes and prays. The Pharisee says, I thank you, God. Lord of heaven and earth, I'm not like this publican over here. The publican can't even lift up his eyes. He just begins to beat on his chest. It's like his heart is hurting. It's aching. Oh, mercy me, the sinner. Mercy me. Kept on saying, mercy me. Jesus said he went home justified. 
internalize it. Internalize it. And so, it's evidence of the new birth. Been born again? Now look, some people may be easier than others to love. Some people may be challenging to love. But the, but the growing of the heart of a follower of Jesus Christ is to love. We may find lifestyles disgusting. But somewhere in there is the love. You love, you love the lost. You want to see them come to Christ. You love the saved. Those who, who seem to have a knack of getting under your skin, but oh, how you want to grow in fellowship with them. You, you want to cultivate the relationship here on earth to where when God takes you to heaven, it's not a shocking transition for you. It's, it's like, oh, and it's great to see you here. Welcome. That's part of the new birth. Well, third thing I want you to see His love for one another is supremely demonstrated in the death of Jesus Christ. Look, by this we know love. We can have an idea of love. We can feel love. John says we know love by this. That he, speaking of Jesus, laid down his life for us. Behold, What wondrous love is this. Oh, my soul. Oh, my soul. What wondrous love is this. Oh, my soul. What wondrous love is this that caused the Lord of bliss to bear the dreadful curse for my soul. For my soul. And this we know, love. And we ought, there's obligation there. It's not an option. It's not for super spiritual Christians. It's not for people who have the gift of, no. We ought, all followers of Jesus Christ, have a divine obligation placed upon us to lay down our lives for the brothers. And that may well be. Some of us in this room will actually live to see the day when we will be called upon to be martyred for the sake of the brethren. I'm not one of these guys that's going to tell you that we're all going to be snatched out of here before it gets like that. I'm not going to do it to you. That's an American notion that sounds hollow in the ears of the persecuted church who are dying today for Christ. We ought. Now, most of us will not be called upon to do it. But you see, laying down your life, if we're thinking about one anothering, part of laying down your life is you set aside those things that you might otherwise consider an inconvenience. You, you use your liberty to provoke one another and encourage one another and bear with one another. You don't, you don't claim that, that you're, you're an island unto yourself, that your life is yours, everybody else can stay away. No, that's, that's, that's totally contrary to the gospel spirit. Look at verse 17. But if anyone has the world's goods and sees his brother in need, look at the family connection here, yet closes his heart against him, how does God's love abide in him? John says, where's the love of God? Then? If, you've been, if you've been born again, brought out of death to life, you... You love. You love the brothers. You love one another. There's so many, so many easy, tangible ways to show love for one another. I would submit to you that, that gathering together when we gather to study important things, you say, that's, that's an opportunity for me to show love to the one teaching. It's an opportunity for me to show love to the ones gathering. It's an opportunity for me to demonstrate to them I recognize the value of this. And at this time frame in my life, this is more valuable than anything else I could be engaged in. It's simple. Oh, preacher, you're just, that's just a sneaky way of saying everybody ought to attend. No, it's not. 
No, it's not. When we were heading down to Beaumont a few weeks ago to preach my sister's funeral, and I'd heard about the different family coming in, I did not once, and Karen over I didn't look at Karen and go, oh my goodness, help me get through this. Having to be with my family. Oh, no. In the midst of tears and grief, with hope at the death of my sister, I longed for and was excited to, to connect with family that we hadn't seen in a while. We'll be doing that again this week. This time, Karen's side of the family. No! You love being with family. You love being around family. And you love to bless family. So he asked this question. If you see a need, and it's within your power to meet it, and you say, well, God bless you. Hope you get that worked out. I'll be praying for you. He says, where's the love of God? Where, where is it? Where's that, where's that love that was birthed in you in the new birth? Where is it? How, does, how can you say that the love of God abides in you with such an attitude? How different it would have been for our dear brothers and sisters who've come home on furlough for us to say, Boy, we're sorry to hear about the trouble you're having that the renters savaged your place while you were away, but God bless you. We're going to be praying for you. Well, I mean, they would appreciate our prayers, but I mean, how different. But you know what I'm, I haven't asked them this, but I'm quite convinced you don't have to question, they have to wonder, are these folks praying for me? Why? Because they see the love of God being fleshed out toward them. James says it this way in James chapter 2, verses 15 and 16. If a brother or sister is poorly clothed and lacking in daily food, and one of you says to them, go in peace, be warm and filled. This is the Bill Askell edition. I'll be praying for you. Without giving them the things needed for the body, what good is that? Yeah. Jesus Christ is the highest example. We have to look no further than the cross. Jesus said it, and we looked at this a couple weeks ago, that we're, we're friends of Jesus if we love one another. Greater love has no one than this, than someone lay down his life for his friends. And you're my friends, Jesus said, if you do whatever I've commanded you. And I will remind you, I just commanded you moments ago to love one another as I have loved you. And when you watch me die on the cross, Yes, it's for your salvation. Yes, it's bearing the wrath of God. Yes, it's bearing your sin before Him and satisfying His divine justice by suffering and dying and rising again in your place. Yes, it is all of those, but it is also a demonstration of sacrifice and self-denial so that when, I, when you hear reverberating in your heart and mind in the days and months and years to come, love one another as I have loved you, that your mind will be taken to the cross. And so we love. We respond to the example of our Savior. John says it this way in 1 John 4, 20. If anyone says, I love God... And hates his brother. Remember now, hatred, yeah, there's, there is open hostility. That's, that, there is seething disdain. But what we've looked at passages that say failure to love is equivalent to hate in Bible measurements. There's no neutral ground. And hates his brother. He's a liar. But I love God. Liar. I didn't say that. That's John saying that. Liar, quote the Apostle John. For he who does not love his brother, whom he has seen, cannot love God whom he has not seen. This is one of the things that blows me away about people. People who, multitudes, who profess to be Christians, who imagine they can live life apart from functioning in a vital way in the body of Christ, and that heaven will be their home. I would remind you that C.S. Lewis, in his book, The Great Divorce, 
talking about the chasm between heaven and hell, said, the way some professing Christians live while they're on earth, talking about a lifestyle, but he's also talking about complacency toward being a vital part of the body of Christ, local body of believers. He said, heaven would be hell for them if they were to get there. How can you love God and you not sin if you, you don't intentionally love your brother whom you can see? If it's within our power to bless, then we should bless. And again, I've been on the receiving end of, of this blessedness in recent days, and you have no... I don't have the ability to write or say or act in a way that, that tells you how full mine and Karen's hearts are from your ministry of encouragement, your ministry of presence, of, of being there, your, your ministry of prayers, your intercessions. We saw the handiwork of God. And in every one of those things, don't despise any, in every one of those things, you were one anothering me. You were one anothering Karen. We can, we can do this, brothers and sisters. We can ramp it up to a feverish pitch and cultivate in this place a climate that when lonely people, hurting people, beaten up people, people who felt despised and rejected, People who don't think anybody would really love them if they knew all about them can walk in among us, can brush up against us, and they can experience something that is a foretaste of heaven, and I think it will have a compelling and magnetic draw to it. And we're not challenging you to do something that you don't know how to do. In closing, we're challenging you to do something that is built into you if you've been born again. We're challenging you to do something that all you need to do is turn your eyes upon Jesus, look full in his wonderful face, and the things of earth grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. And when you see him and you hear him say to you, and you are my friends, if you do whatever I've commanded you, and chief among the commands, it's that you love one another. And we're challenging you to do things that you're already doing at some scale, some level. One anothering, living in a gospel community. Let's pray. Dear Holy Father, you're the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. We bow before you today in Jesus' name. Oh, how we thank you. Oh, mercy is new every day. We thank you for your word that is so clear, sometimes painfully clear. And yet, we know that when we read passages like we're looking at today, we, can, we can find ourselves somewhat wounded by it. The proverb says that the wounds of a friend are faithful. Your word is our friend. Your spirit is our friend to take the word and press it to us so that as we are squeezed by it, there might result from that increasing conformity to the image of Jesus Christ. We thank you for your word. We thank you for the new birth, which makes us someone we were not before, which turns us from being self-absorbed to selflessly engaged in loving Jesus and doing what he commands, in, in loving others as he loves us. And we thank you, Lord, that we can look to Christ. We never have to wonder, well, what, what, would, this, what would this look like? We just look to Christ. And in gazing upon him, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, despising its shame, that we're enabled by your spirit to run the race marked out for us and to run it with vigor, to run it with joy, to run it with zeal, to run it with hopefulness, to run it with a purpose to touching as many people in the journey between now and heaven. Thank you. Thank you for the cross. Thank you for the empty tomb. 
Thank you for the hope we have in Jesus Christ as we make our prayer in his name. Amen. Let's stand together. We sing, preparing.